Okay. Matt Fury, CEO, Memorial Hermann Prevention and Recovery Center in Houston, Texas. Amy Granberry, Charles Place Recovery Center in Corpus Christi, and also the Association of Substance Abuse Programs. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, members. Uh, thank you first for letting me come and address you today and be a part of this hearing. Uh, one in 16 people prescribed opioids become addicted to them. It only takes seven days to become dependent or addicted to prescription opioids. Opioid pain relievers are no more effective at managing chronic pain than opioid pain, non-opioid non pain relievers. That just came out two weeks ago. 80% um, of all heroin users started first with prescription opioids. And nationally, opioid misuse contributes to over 420,000 emergency department visits per year. An overnight opioid overdose hospital admission in Texas cost over $36,000. So over the last few years, physicians have been changing their medication selections and prescription practices to rein in the opioid impact. And just in a few weeks ago, dentists, they're now on board with finally recognizing their part in prevention by reducing the number of opioid prescriptions and providing alternative medications to manage pain associated with dental procedures. Actually, for adolescents who become involved with using opioids, dentists are their primary entry point. While opioids are only one facet of the substance use problem in our state, and we need to remember that methamphetamine in our rural communities is actually a larger problem than opioids are, um, they are garnering significant attention due to their deadly effects. And my attitude is anything that brings attention to this is not necessarily a bad thing. So we as a state and as a community can garner our resources and our, our knowledge to uh, attack it. Um, some of the stats that I included, you know, are that the number of people dying from heroin, fentanyl, and prescription opioid overdoses continues to rise approximately 10% per year, and uh, almost 47,000 nationally in 2017 died from opioid-related overdose out of 67,000 accidental drug deaths. Um, in Texas, deaths from opioid overdose have been increasing approximately 10% per year since 2014 when we had 1,174 deaths, uh, actually in 2015, and it's climbing. Some of the more recent st stats aren't available. But this is primarily fueled by heroin and fentanyl overdoses because prescription drug overdose deaths have been leveling off or declining in our state, and that's a good sign as a result of legislative action and other things that have been done with the prescription monitoring program and, and other things where physicians practice have changed. Um, while that matches the trend where people who used to access their opioids via prescriptions, unfortunately a lot of them are turning to illicit drugs such as heroin since prescription opioids are harder to obtain and more expensive than heroin. That's an unintended consequence of ratcheting back opioid prescriptions. But you have to start somewhere. You have to do something. Um, I think people are very familiar with the fact that fentanyl is a highly potent opioid, it's 50 times more powerful than heroin, and it's dosed in micrograms rather than milligrams. It's used as an anesthetic and other things. Unfortunately, when it's mixed with heroin, the uh, the people that are mixing it aren't doing it in labs where they're following FDA and other guidelines on how to do it, and, and that's where a lot of our overdoses occur. Because And we know that with um, opioid opioids, respiratory failure is really what happens. You just stop breathing and never start again, and that's one of our problems. Uh, per capita, while Texas doesn't match up against other states with the highest overdose incidents, the state still has a major problem and overdose deaths continue to increase. So, but the, the prevalence of substance use in Texas follows the national average and all classes of drugs, about 6.5% of this population has a substance use disorder. So I bring a lot of this up because we, how do you frame the situation? As a committee, you've certainly reviewed most of these stats or know a lot about it, but how is it impacting us in Texas, and what do we know about treatment in general? And that's, that's what I've been engaged in for most of my professional career. Substance, substance use disorders of all types are very treatable, but we are dealing with a chronic relapsing disease. And in a lot of cases, it's, it's not going to be managed successfully and will involve return to use. 
So treatment should include all options and medications that can effectively allow someone to live a healthy, productive life without continued use of mood-altering substances. And for some, we know that abstinence from substances may not be uh, more than an ideal, which is why many state and federal responses and strategies are focused on harm reduction, uh, which is preventing accidental death, reducing the spread of communicable diseases such as HIV and Hep C, and stopping criminal activity to sustain use. So. Um, I don't know how much everybody knows about what MAT, M-A-T, medication assisted treatment, but that's become the most recommended approach for treating individuals with addictions to opioids. And MAT should include all medications used to treat addiction and should not be limited to one type of medication. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of information on that. I'll try to jump through this but because that's there. But, but what we have is federal grants as applied by the state require most programs who access those funds to include medications which may conflict with other abstinence-based treatment approaches offered in the same treatment setting. So specifically, medications that contain the partial agonist buprenorphine, which is an opioid, are the most used medications to address opioid dependence. This medication activates the brain's opioid receptors without producing the euphoric feeling usually produced, and it allows many people to feel normal and function without the cravings that drive use. So it has a place. It's a, it's a positive medication. But for many people with addictions, especially those who are polysubstance dependent, meaning they use opioids and they use cocaine, they use stimulant, other stimulants, they use alcohol, there's a lot of different things on top of that, benzodiazepines, that may not be the best solution. Using an addiction medication to treat an addiction can be counterproductive in some cases. So we need to have access to antagonist opioid blocking medications such as naltrexone and they should be included. It is non-narcotic, blocks opioids by attaching to the opioid receptors without activating them. It is also available in a long-acting monthly dosage. So it can be costly but it is preferred by correctional systems across our country and is becoming more widely used in treatment programs and settings. So, um, but one of the things to remember is by its very definition, MAT, or medication-assisted treatment, combines medication with therapy, counseling, and mutual support. It's not in place or instead of the other therapeutic treatment components. So with medication dispensing taking place primarily in physician offices where additional counseling or support is not generally offered, the majority of people using buprenorphine have only a few minutes with the physician and pick up a prescription for another month. There are over 800 buprenorphine wavered physicians in Texas, so you have to have special training to be able to administer it as a physician. And now, Mr. Fear, yes, sir. Uh, the, the 800 wavered physicians in Texas, I mean, are those geographically located in more heavily populated areas? They are. Yeah, and that's one of the challenges is when you get out into the rural counties, um, you know, you almost have to depend where you can on telemedicine or other ways. But now with the rules have been expanded, um, physician assistants, or I should say uh, nurse practitioners who work for a licensed physician can also be involved in uh, writing prescriptions and working through them under that waiver. So this is part of the Data 2000 waiver that that enabled physicians to do office-based opioid treatment rather than everything being focused when you're using these type medications in a, like a methadone clinic, which are still very plentiful and active in our state and do a good job. So if a nurse practitioner is um, properly trained and the physician who is their delegating or supervising physician, right. they, they both have to be, I guess, is what, what you're saying. That's correct. Exactly. They have to go through a special training to be able to do it. But a lot of the counseling and the other wraparound services are suggested. They're, they're intended to be part of what we call medication-assisted treatment, but what happens a lot of times is that you don't have the ability to to treat as many people or to have those services in your office and what it becomes is, is a dispensing visit and uh, and I have to I hate to say but a lot of the physicians only accept cash for this medication or for that office visit and so it, it's it's kind of a uh, it can be a challenge there's a great number of fantastic providers out there with the patient's intentions in mind but we have to remember when you're using a medication that has a street value and unfortunately this one does it gets diverted it gets manipulated it gets transferred it gets used we have people who go into an office and get 16 milligrams and they use eight and they sell the other eight at multiplied times the monthly dose. It is a challenge, so that means we have to manage and monitor it a little bit differently, and, and unfortunately that's the nature of 
working with an addictive substance. It is considered, from an evidence-based standpoint, one of the better mechanisms for achieving recovery in some. So I'm not here to poo-poo the whole thing, but the average person doesn't understand that it is not the answer to every opioid situation. If you're a doctor, uh, you're in a licensed profession, you're an airline pilot, you cannot use this medication. So there's, there's a lot of uh, challenges there. Um, but a lot of programs do very good work using this, and, and there's, there's a place for it. It just often doesn't work when you put someone who can't use it next to someone who does, and they're going, I, I want what he's having. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a challenge. In rural Texan, Texas, where program access is limited, it's harder to do more than receive the medication, which I mentioned, and the lack of wraparound counseling and other treatment services. So uh, initial dropout rates can be higher after three to four months, usually around 40 to 50 percent, and for poorly defined exit strategies, if they're not involved in a really specific program where they're managing it very well for them, could mean that that person uh, is not able to, to move into a different state of, of using or of being treated. Um, as far as compliance and diversion, we know they're a problem, but here's another problem. If a patient doesn't comply with the program or physician guidelines, they get dropped from the program, and unless they're really routed to another program where they can pick that up, what happens when a person is using a medication that you can withdraw from if you stop using it is you're going to substitute something else for it and go from there. So again, you know, the, the new rules by HHS are requiring that other treatment components be included in that with the only negative being the program requirements may be limiting access in areas of the state where there are fewer or no treatment providers. There's been a lot of advocacy with HHS and they're listening on trying to expand the medications appropriated and, and being able to use and, and I know that, that Amy can address some of that if, if need be, but there's a lot of um, good work being done and, and the state is looking at every option. So uh, what, what I do at Memorial Hermann Park, the Prevention and Recovery Center, and the majority of private residential treatment programs in Texas, we prefer the opioid blocking medication because of its non-narcotic makeup. There are success stories on both sides of the medication-assisted treatment equation, but people do need to be aware of the challenges with using any addictive medication as a primary treatment mechanism. So how would we solve this problem with opioid overuse as well as other substance use that is happening on so many fronts? So I kind of chronicled it under prevention, intervention, and treatment, and that kind of takes in everything from law enforcement to treatment to legislative activity. I think physicians are doing a good job in changing prescription practices. You have to start somewhere. If you keep doling out prescriptions at the same rate, it will continue the problem. Are there losers in any change to that? Probably so. But the, we're trying to create safety nets across our state through health providers to catch those individuals to help them, not to make their problem worse. In 2017, THA issued new opioid prescribing guidelines for hospitals to apply in emergency department settings, and hospitals are voluntarily reducing the amount of opioids being used pre-op and post-op with positive results for managing pain. Primary care physicians and chronic pain physicians are offering effective medication and procedural alternatives to their patients, and this is real important that patients are becoming more knowledgeable about the potential dangers of opioid misuse and are actively seeking alternatives from their physicians. It's shifting the paradigm from the patient always asking for the strongest pain relief possible. And it is really demand reduction in its finest or best form. People are becoming more aware. The work you as legislators are doing, the work that treatment organizations and communities and municipalities and the media, all the attention being focused is causing people to ask those questions and really think before they take a highly potent medication. Certainly they're great medications. I'm never going to say I'd want them available if something happened to me and I needed one. But it's, it's how are we dosing them, how are we using them, when are they, they doing that. I think schools can certainly engage in more prevention efforts through information and education of students. But I, 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 the most important thing is that the entire prevention effort, if it is to be effective, has to start with well-informed adults, educators, health providers, and leaders. We all have to be involved. Intervention. Everybody here is familiar with the medication naloxone, the opioid overdose reversal drug. It's an important tool for first responders, law enforcement, um, hospitals, treatment providers, and individuals to have on hand to help prevent accidental death when an overdose occurs. And the state has provided funds to multiple local entities through grants to make the medication more available. Hospitals 
Uh, both medical and psychiatric treatment programs and health providers are conducting more screenings for substance use disorder and referring more people to treatment. Um, we need to do more of that across our state. That needs to be done where services are provided. Over 50% of all visits to an emergency department are related to substance use. That may not be as what's documented on the, the chart, but that's what brought them there in the first place or caused the health condition. So we need to do a better job of addressing that. That doesn't take federal or state dollars. That takes education of the individuals delivering those services to, uh, to do their part to reduce supply, uh, I mean to reduce demand. And law enforcement agencies are doing their part to reduce supply. I think the DEA and other and local entities have done a great job of that. The prescription monitoring program is giving physicians a powerful tool to learn more about medication use patterns. And again, it's not to identify someone to restrict or not provide help to them. It's to be able to provide the right kind of help and help them find sources. So um, in the treatment side, I think access to treatment at all levels is needed. Residential and outpatient treatment programs, both public funded and private, they play a significant part in building a safety net for people with addictions. And treatment programs do treat more than opioid dependence. Methamphetamine is a huge problem in some parts of the state. Other stimulants such as cocaine are seeing a huge resurgence. And while benzodiazepines, which include your sedatives, muscle relaxers, anti-anxiety meds, synthetics like Kush and K2, uh, highly potent marijuana, and good old alcohol, they combine to exacerbate the overall drug problem in our state. So we are having to deal with it because as I said earlier, people aren't just using one class of drug. And one of the positives here is treatment is moving from an episodic model to a disease management model based on evidence and learn, looking to involve multiple levels of durations and durations of care. So we're seeing agencies and organizations, both private, public, not-for-profit, for-profit, working together to provide a continuum that really works to bring people back to productivity and so forth. Parity enforcement passed in the last legislative session. I think that's doing, going to do a lot. We're still in the form of stages of working between providers, consumers, and HHS and TDI to figure out ways to handle consumer and provider complaints so that insurance don't, insurers don't unevenly and more restrictively apply insurance rules to behavioral health treatment over medical treatment. And that continues to happen. Uh, so across all these areas, prevention, intervention, treatment, there is a need for more treatment professionals of all types. And programs like ours and Amy's and others are working with agencies such as TAP and TCBAP and others to work with our colleges and universities to develop a workforce to, to uh, provide these services across the um, spectrum. And, and really, finally, a major challenge in treating addictions is that I do believe researchers and scientists need to develop new medications and approaches to enhance the work that's already being done. We need more options. We need to be able to help people find results and ways to uh, kind of rewire the brain uh, since the addictive brain is wired differently. And, and one thing I'll say is that addiction is manifested in behaviors that negatively impact communities, families, relationships, health and well-being. They diminish productivity and reduce the quality of life for the person who suffers from addiction. We all know that. That's what drives the stigma that we experience and hardens hearts. So addictions accompanying behaviors are not an excuse, but we must treat addiction like the chronic disease it is. And then we're going to be able to change the accompanying behaviors. Finally, um, I work with Memorial Hermann. I've been with the organization 16 years. I'm part of the Prevention and Recovery Center and Behavioral Health Services. We are a leader in the providing of, of abstinence-based treatment services across Texas with a history going back 35 years. We have residential treatment located in Houston. We also have offices around the Houston area and in San Antonio and Austin providing outpatient support. Uh, we are one of the frontline providers for families seeking help with substance use disorders. And we are an in-network provider, meaning we work with most insurers and managed care companies. So a large number of Texans can access treatment at an organization like ours. And we do full continuum of care and, and work with, uh, we have specialty programs that deal with chronic pain and addiction, as well as work with licensed professionals such as physicians and lawyers. Um, I'm very proud of the medical staff we have, I'm proud of the work we do. We have the only accredited addiction medicine fellowship in the state of Texas that trains physicians. We've produced eight addiction medicine uh, fellows over the last six or seven years. And we also provide services in our hospital system to deal with people with emergency uh, substance use disorders and psychiatric 
uh, mental health issues. They come in, our emergency response team treats them. We offer a safety net to the Houston community with three mental health crisis clinics that are open to all comers. So I'm, I'm very proud of the work we do and how we partner with, with local agencies, with state agencies, and with other individuals to provide these services. So um, I'm glad to be a part of our state and hope to continue to be a part of the solution to, to help our state uh, come up with answers to solve these problems. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, Representative Sheffield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A lot of us, or a lot in the South, grew up with the idea that addiction was due to mental weakness, psychological failing, lack of a spiritual faith, that sort of thing. But I believe medical science has proven that addiction has a genetic component. It does. Would you please comment on the role of genetics in addiction medicine? What we know is that the, um, um, there are some times where it continues through one generation to the next, other times where it skips generation. But the thing that's going to determine whether or not that person lives out an addiction is if they activate that part of the brain that turns that switch and turns it on and starts the path towards addiction. And we know plenty of people can take opioids, for instance, and become dependent on them. But when they stop, if they're managed and they just ratchet down or, or uh, titrate off it, they're, they're going to be fine. They're not, they're not going to have that desire, that push to do it. But in some individuals, because of the way the, the brain is impacted, it sends a different signal and it says, I got to have that in order to maintain this feeling or move on. So the hereditary aspect of it is we do not have enough information to know, you know, if it's always going to be there, but what we've always advised people is that if you have a history of alcoholism or addiction in your family, it's usually a good idea to refrain and to not push it to find out how far you go, or at least to be aware. So we know that it does uh, pass on, but we don't. There's not as much information that I'm aware of scientifically that that proves it's specifically hereditary. Uh, one source I read. Two other questions. One source I read about uh, addiction recovery is that when people are coming out of recovery, uh, the brain circuitry is still scrambled, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And you hear of 28 and 30 day programs. The source I read said for some it can take up to two years of treatment that is for right. the brain chemistry to reassert a normalcy. My comment on that is one of the reasons uh, treatment providers engage so many follow-up services and, and try to enlist the person to get into various social support, mutual support programs, 12-step programs, and other types of support is so that they have a way to kind of redirect while they're the brain is going through that, that healing process and while their thinking processes are also changed. We know that, that 90 days can help make a habit. That's why even going back the science shows that continued repeated doing of something different will eventually change the way that thought process goes and allow someone to move forward and be able to do it. That's where the behavioral therapy and the other types of work come in that treatment organizations engage in and that's why there's a certain amount of repetition and things that go on. So while we can't solve every problem within in a less than 30 day period or a two week period or a six week period um, and there are programs that provide ongoing services, not everybody with an addiction needs the same route to get to success and some people do very well because you're intervening a lot of times at an earlier stage of the addiction and we're able to get people to to uh, make enough change to where they can do it a person in a real chronic state of the disease it does take a longer time and uh, it can take two years or longer but for most there's a real success can nice question uh, comment on the uh, some folks back home are worried about medical marijuana mm -hmm. becoming addictive when it's used in medical purposes. Do you have any experience with that and could you comment on that? Well again if, if um, uh, we we don't use heroin as a um, we don't you know you don't go to the store or go to the doctor and get a prescription for heroin the drugs the opioids have been acetylized and made in the different types of things and they're usually delivered in a pill form or some type of way to help and I know I'm talking about a more addictive drug but 
a lot of what's going on with medical marijuana is if it is being dispensed in a way that's in a medical kind of a way and there's just demonstrated that it can provide relief to a system, that might be good for some for that particular thing. I don't know that that's going to be a, a problem, but smoking anything, I don't know what the health benefits are of smoking anything, and that's one of the challenges with marijuana. Also, the potency of it is... Uh, is is scary today it is not what people in our uh, age range and even 20 years younger than us experience it's 20 to 40 times more potent what's on the street today what our kids are using it's uh, the brain doesn't finish growing or developing till you're age 25 and you put something that has an active ingredient called THC which lodges in the fatty cells of the brain even though the high wears off the lingering effects of that that drug, that psychoactive ingredient, stay in the brain for 30 days or more. And if you use it a lot, it could take six months or longer for it to flush out. And the reality is, is it alters the way not only people think or feel, but the way they respond and react over a longer period of time. It's been a problem. Colorado and Washington State are having a heck of a time as a result of the legalization. From a medical standpoint, um, I think we can find a medical use for just about any type of uh, plant or substance on this planet, and we pretty much have. But that argument is often used to be pro-legal and because you know, people don't die from overdosing on marijuana, they just get real sick. But I will say the leading cause of of um, uh, poison incidents in the state of Colorado is due to marijuana now from edibles and so forth. So it's an interesting uh, dynamic of what's taking place. Uh, sorry, this sure. will be the last one, I promise. Okay. <laughs> uh, last session we passed a bill for the Dravet syndrome non-THC uh, cannabinoid. Okay. And so without the THC in there, then the possibility of addiction is almost zero? Probably almost eliminated. Nothing. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Chairman Alvarado. Thank you. Hello. Thank Hi. you for your work in Houston. Thank you. Picking up on uh, Dr. Sheffield's comments about about genetics, I guess, you know, my hope would be that um, as we learn more about it being hereditary and, and gen um, the, the uh, genetic issue, that there can be some type of prevention because you you can now take tests to see if you're prone to right. heart disease or stroke or uh, diabetes and other things. So hopefully we'll get to that point. Absolutely. Um, can you comment on w what type of opioid there's a higher um, prescription of in Texas? And we know that it's to treat pain, but do you have information on what type of pain? How specific of information do you have on the, the type of opioids that are, I guess, used the most in Texas and for what ailment? Well, they, they actually follow the national trends. Oxycodone and hydrocodone classes are the highest, oxycodone being the number one. So the drug oxycontin, and then you get down to the, the trade names besides that one. Vicodin is, is highly prescribed. But, but what, what would we see the most commercials of? Um, uh, well, you wouldn't see too many commercials for the opioids. They're not really advertising okay. those. Um, they, they, they advertise uh, opioid constipation medicine for a while on, uh, on television, but, but uh, that was about a year ago. Mm. I don't uh, think I remember that one. Oh, it was, it was, yeah, I remember it well. But anyway, it's... With, um, well. Never yeah. mind. I was going to ask yeah. for a description. But no, I, but, but anyway, that's one of the side effects of opioids. Okay. And so, and because so many people are using them to treat a chronic pain condition, usually, um, they're obviously very good for an acute episode of pain. And But they're usually dosed, or they should be dosed in very short order, uh, two days, three days. But a lot of times, because physicians don't want to be called back, you get a 30-day prescription. Mm -hmm. The problem is a lot of these drugs wind up sitting on the shelf because a lot of people don't need it, and they know that, and they don't take them. And and they become a, an opportunity for diversion or used by kids or, or some other thing, or you give them to your relatives and so forth. But the um, uh, the medications themselves are typically, it's, it's a pain medication. That's what it's to do, and it's generally been used to treat chronic pain. Um, it was They originally were focused more on, on uh, cancer-related pain mm -hmm. and end-of-life pain uh, related to that. And so that's what's transformed is that when physicians 
Uh, going back to the mid 90s, uh, there were new formulations of these drugs made that were supposedly harder to abuse, that were addiction resistant. I mean, that's actually how they were marketed. Physicians were lulled into this belief that this is the drug we need to prescribe, this is the medication we need to use. And instead of trying other uh, medications such as your ibuprofens and your acetaminophens at maybe a little higher dose, people went to that. People, a lot of people liked the way they made them feel, liked the pain reduction opportunities, and, and continued to use And they're them. quicker. The, yeah. 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 The effect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Representative Murr. Mr. Fieri, you, you mentioned in your testimony that uh, methamphetamine in rural parts of Texas are a bigger problem, and I was going to ask if you would expand upon that a little bit. Why, why is that your belief, and, and what do you base it on? Part of that is based on what I hear talking with officials in other counties that um, when you're talking about the drug problem, you're part of either a conference or a presentation somewhere and, and they're letting you know about that. The other part is what we're seeing in our own treatment center. Um, we, we are seeing more people who come from outside the Houston area, East Texas, sometimes uh, some of the rural counties in Central Texas, where that's what they're stating is their main a drug of use, their main primary issue, and and so uh, in looking at that, we're we're seeing it both from an anecdotal experiential standpoint and also from what other people are reporting. I also work with a lot of other colleagues around the state who provide treatment services, and through my association with them and meetings we go to, that is what I'm hearing from them, and they're also hearing that from their local law enforcement representatives based on, um, you know interdictions and seizures and other things but that's what we're seeing that's and, a challenge and so I agree with you and I base that on my experiences interaction with with law enforcement and others in rural areas have y'all analyzed a little bit or try to determine why that is do you have a uh, one or more causes that you can point to all I can point to is it, it from from what I've seen over my years uh, here in our state it's always been a popular drug you know a lot of drugs ebb and flow but that one tends to stay why some of it is because the cost to produce it is is pretty low and uh, access is is pretty high in terms of people being able to access it and I think that has a lot to do with it and it's a stimulant and a lot of people like the way a stimulant makes them feel it's also highly addictive so uh, once a person begins to take that depending on them it, it just it's like there's a heavy drive for it but again it's easy to access right right and in your testimony you mentioned a little bit about how some opioid use in rural areas is sort of limited because of availability of a variety of different factors that go into to that oversight do you think because of that void methamphetamine has filled that in the rural areas um, I think that has a okay. lot to do with it thank you mr. chairman thank you uh, representative Menhars. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning. I wanted to shift you back uh, to your testimony regarding Matt. Okay. Um, you made a, a comment about um, the high cost of the medications that are used mm -hmm. in that. Can you give me or give us a, an estimate of how of how much those medications run? Well, um, the drug buprenorphine or Suboxone runs a l less than the drug now Trexone, which there's a brand name Vivitrol, which is the injectable uh, blocking drug. It is, um, for commercial purposes, if you use your insurance and go get it, it retails at about $1,200 for a 30-day injection. It, it's just like even naloxone, which is the opioid reversal drug, the pharmaceutical manufacturers, you know, increased that price, mm -hmm. as you know, and it made it harder for states to budget for that and so forth. So um, uh, I'm hopeful that drugs like that will see a reduction in cost through the Medicaid program and through some of the uh, arrangements the company has with states. That cost is is significantly less than that. But I do not have cost data on that. I'm I'm not associated with them or no. I just know of the medication and for patients who come to us where they get on it, they're able to use their insurance, and I know what the retail cost is. I don't know what the insurers actually reimburse them for the medication. But there's that, and then the, there's a variety of medications that are buprenorphine based, and and they run a gamut in prices. Uh, there's generics available there, but they're limited, and uh, I don't recall the exact pricing on that, but it's less. Okay, thank you. You bet. Thank you, Mr. Fury. We appreciate your testimony. Thank